Breaking news this just in, Jesus Christ, the one claiming to be the Messiah, has just informed us that he must that die. He must die. He must die. I, I don't know what this means. What now? Who is he? Really? family good morning another hour left of this uh, daylight savings morning <laughs> bruh <laughs> I am uh, I'm gonna try to keep my energy a little bit uh, preserved um, uh, and reserved uh, this morning when notice the key word being try uh, been uh, battling some illness all week, non-COVID, um, and uh, yeah, it's been a it's been a long week. But I'm so grateful for my wife. She's been taking good good care of me, and for the prayers of the saints. Amen. 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 Um, I have not said this yet, but my name is Sunny, one of the pastors here at Detroit Church, and we have been in a series for over a year now in the Gospel of Mark. And I'm telling y'all, man, it's been rich. It's been blessing my life so much and giving me deeper perspective and understanding of the goodness of God and the person of Jesus and what he's done. And I pray that uh, today uh, that your, as my dad used to say, spiritual saliva glands are secreting. <laughs> you, that's something you can't forget. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, got to love Pops. Got to love him. Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14, <laughs> verse 12. Mm, the Lord is faithful. The Lord is good. Let's read the word of God. <clears throat> and on the first day of unleavened bread, when they sacrificed the Passover lamb, his disciples said to him, where will you have us go and prepare for you to eat the Passover? And he sent two of his disciples and said to them, Go into the city, and a man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. And wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, Where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? And he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. And the disciples set out and went to the city and found it just as he had told them. And they prepared the Passover. And when it was evening, he came with the twelve. And as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus said, Truly I say to you, one of you will betray me who is eating with me. They began to be sorrowful and to say to him one after another, is it I? He said to them, it is one of the 12, one who is dipping bread into the dish with me. 
For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. And as they were eating, he took bread. And after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, Take, this is my body. And he took a cup And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. And when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the mount of olives. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading of his word. So, this opening scene here takes place just before sundown on a Thursday evening, right? This would be the start of what was known as Passover Friday. Passover Friday. In order to understand what is happening here in this narrative, you got to understand this isn't just any Passover, right? This is, this would be Jesus' Passover, okay? This is the Passover that would change everything. This is something that they were very, very familiar with. This Passover meal would be something that they were accustomed to practicing and honoring their entire lives. This Passover meal, though this Passover meal, again, was was like none of the others they had ever experienced. Why is that? This Passover meal right here pointed to something behind them, something beside them, and something that was before them. (laughs) It pointed to 1,500 years earlier. It looks to the next 24 hours And it looks to a determined time only known by God, the Father. It's hard for us to understand what is in the air as Jesus is explaining to them what he wants them to do. I have a slide here that's a a little (laughs) AI-generated Uh, first century Passover slide, just to kind of pique our interest a little bit. And um, this would be a time when the, the Passover lambs, the Passover lambs would begin to be sacrificed, right? The streets would be crowded more than usual with, with worshipers from all over the world who had gathered in Jerusalem for this occasion. This was a special time. The, the, the smell in the air would, would, would mean something to them. It, it was different. Not just because there were more people, but because there were lambs that were being prepared for the Passover meal. What I mean by prepared, well, there are a lot of things. The first thing that it meant is the lamb had to be captured and the lamb had to be slain. All right? So there's this distinctness about what what this moment means. There's an excitement I would even uh, uh, assume that the disciples have, and they are asking this question like they're knowing. They know that time is running out, like it's almost time to prepare for this Passover meal, and this is a meal that takes some time to get ready for because of how crowded the streets were. You had to have a place reserved for you, right? You had to have somewhere to go. It's almost like trying to find a restaurant to eat on Easter. Now, I don't know about you and your family, but my family, more times than not, on Sunday, after Easter Sunday, man, listen, grandma wasn't necessarily cooking on that Sunday, right? We were going out to a restaurant, and it took most times an hour at least just to get a table. Why? Because all of my cousins and your cousins were there. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And the, uh, what especially comes to mind are like the buffet restaurants. Y'all remember them? 
I can't even do that. <laughs> do, they, do those even exist anymore? Old Country Buffet, Golden Corral, yikes. <laughs> and we have on our pastel Easter suits. Hey Amen. Sugar, sugar sharp. There was a lot of preparation that had to go into the, the time of the moment when they would celebrate this Passover. Now get this. It wasn't just a holiday to celebrate because it's fun to celebrate. No. This, like imagine the nostalgia of Christmas with deeper cultural and deeper spiritual meaning. Okay? Nearly 1,500 years earlier, prior God had established the first Passover. God established this. On the very night that the Israelites were first freed from slavery, free, freed from Egypt, and after God had sent many plagues to Egypt to loosen the oppressive uh, hold that Pharaoh had on the descendants of Abraham, God's chosen people, one night God said enough is enough and he sent the final plague. My sister Julie briefly touched on this last week. You've been paying attention. We've been kind of mentioning it a little bit here and there over the last few weeks. And this was a big deal. This was a big deal because this night in every home throughout Egypt, there would either be a dead sacrifice, a dead lamb, or a dead child. Death was coming. And death was coming for everybody, not just for some. This was the justice of God. Like, this is judgment coming down. And either it fell on your family and you took refuge under the substitute and were safe, or it fell on your family and you were unprepared. But death was coming for everybody. And if you were prepared, what would happen is the death angel would pass over you. That's why it's called the Passover. But you could only be passed over on the basis of faith in what God had said, the instruction that God had given, and because you had put your faith in a substitute sacrifice, the lamb. The lamb. God had given them very, very specific instruction to do this. And then not only that, every year after that, they were to celebrate it. He gave them, again, very specific rules on how they were to celebrate. So this was something that was, that was deep in their, their culture. If you've ever heard stories of, of, of Jewish families, I'm not sure, maybe some of you maybe even have either friends or maybe you're Jewish and, and your family has celebrated these kinds of things. I've read books on it and I'm always just blown away by the, the nuance of it. The nuance of excitement and celebration and preparation and this, this belief or trust that, that God is up to something. Again, it reflected on something in the past, but now... It's also reflecting on something that is about to happen and then ultimately something that will one day happen and seal the deal. Back to Mark chapter 14. Jesus and his friends, his disciples are on their way to make, uh, to make, a way, make their way to Jerusalem to the upper room where they will celebrate this, get this, this, the last divinely authorized Passover. The last divinely authorized Passover. Now, from this, I want to I wanna, I wanna just kind of spend our time diving in on three Passover realities. Three Passover realities. You see this beautiful table behind me. We're going to partake of what we call communion before we leave here today. I, I, I pray that we can not just do it as some religious ritual or obligation, Something we do on first Sundays, you notice it's not even the first Sunday we're doing it, right? There may be a time when we do it every Sunday. Scripture doesn't give us a specific time. You got to do it this day, this time. But it says that as often as you do it, there's a way to do it. There's a way to do it. So I want to set that up so that you know this is how we're going to end today before we leave. And I pray that as we partake, we do so with deep reflection and worship. And knowing who he is, maybe more than we ever had. So there are three things, three of these Passover realities I want to just kind of double tap on. One, I'll call Passover providence. 
and that is that God is in control. Two, pass over persecution, and that is God is at work. And then three, pass over partnership, pass over partnership, and that is God in our midst. God in our midst. All right, you with me? All right. First one, pass over providence. Now, again, the writer mentions the fact that it's the first day of unleavened bread. He mentions the Passover lamb. He mentions, he, he refers to what this holiday represents and what it is four different times in this passage. That, that's one of the things we can, we, we can t- take a look at and we can see, okay, this is a big deal. Mark wants us to know something that is taking place. This is a, a part of the story. However, time is running out. I can imagine that their disciples likely are feeling a little angst because how can they, with Jesus, right, Jesus the Christ, not be prepared for this experience of worship? But Jesus intentionally waits to the very last minute to prepare them. Now, some of us procrastinators might want to tuck that away, (laughs) If you sometimes like waiting to the last minute to do things, like Jesus, don't do that, all right? (laughs) Don't do that. That would be an excuse. But what I'm saying is Jesus has a specific purpose, a divine purpose in not just what he is doing, but how he is doing it. Pip the, pip the question of the disciples in verse 13. It says, and he sent two of his disciples, and then Jesus says to them, go into the city, and the man carrying a jar of water will meet you. Follow him. Now, even when he tells them what to do, his answer is cryptic. <laughs> now, I've been accused by some folk of being maybe a little cryptic. I forget, the, I forget the word right now that they use. My team, I call them my team and my family even, um, of uh, making people wait to the last minute to unveil the, <laughs> the big idea, right? Now, Jesus here has a very specific reason that he is doing this. Now, understand this. First of all, for him to say there's going to be a young man that is carrying a jug, first of all, would be alarming because that's not what men did. That's not what men did. So I can imagine, they're like, all right, this is going to be a rough 24 hours. Okay, Jesus. This is something that the women or the servants normally did. It wasn't a job necessarily for, for men. So Jesus says, no, this is different. Go look for a man because he's already prepared. Now, what we don't know is that was Jesus telling them this based upon prophetic revelation, right? Did he, like, see into the future, which we know that he has done, could do. He, actually, that had just happened a few chapters earlier when he gave them very specific instruction about what to look for in going into Jerusalem, right? Letting them, letting them know they're going to find a donkey, like that whole scenario. This is very similar. Or did he have a conversation with the man? Did he make preparations that they did not know about prior? We actually do not know that. What we do know is that Jesus here is in control. Like, they're trying to figure out what the details are, what is happening, because, again, this is very familiar to them. This is something that they regularly did. Jesus now says, I'm not going to tell you all the details. First, just go. And when you go, this is what's going to happen. You're going to meet a dude, right? And then when you meet the dude, this is what I want you to say to him. Verse 14, and wherever he enters, say to the master of the house, the teacher says, where is my guest room? where I may eat the Passover with my disciples, and he will show you a large upper room furnished and ready. There, prepare for us. Like the Lord responded to their, their question in the way that, that I, 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 I can see as, as perplexing to them, right? But, but it was necessary because he knew what they didn't know. He knew not only that there would be a man carrying a jug, he knew what was in the heart of one of their own. Why is that important? Now, I don't want to bury the lead here, but we're going to be in this text for a few weeks up until Easter and past Easter, okay? So let's just sit with it. I don't want to also assume that all of you all know what's happening here. 
But we just read a little while ago, Jesus says that one of his own, his own disciples is about to betray him. We touched on it a bit last week as well. Judas, one of the 12, is about to betray him. Another gospel writer tells us that Satan had entered into the heart of Judas. Like we sometimes are quick to see or say or think or pray, God is moving. God, what are you up to? But do you also know that Satan is moving? Often. Word of God tells us that he goes about as a roaring lion. He's not the lion. Don't get it twisted. There's only one lion. But he goes about as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour going to and fro. He's moving. He ain't just like out there moving. No, this is like Jesus' intimate circle, moving, lurking, and one particular has allowed him to come in. Jesus knows that. Jesus knows that if the arrangements for Passover had been communicated prematurely, then because of what was in Judas' heart, the secret location would have been revealed to the chief scribes who would have sent the Roman guards there to arrest Jesus before he had time to celebrate the Passover meal. Not just because Jesus was hungry. And not just because this was a holiday to celebrate. But because this had tremendous salvific meaning for us. We'll see that in a minute here. Peter and John, the other Gospels, let us know, are, are, are the two disciples that go into Jerusalem. That's like two of, the, two of the big three, right? I mean, these are his guys. They go into the city, and it happens according exactly to how Jesus had said it would happen. And it says they prepared for Passover. Now, really quickly, what is happening here? What would this preparation look like? Because this, this may be foreign to some of us, right? The Lord is setting in motion here a plan that, that would enable him to do something that had great meaning even for us today. But, the, but it had to be prepared first. The Passover meal had to be prepared in a very certain way, and it had a very distinct form that included four points which the presider, which was normally the oldest male in the home, the presider would, would hold a glass of wine, he would get up, and he would explain the meaning of the Passover feast. Right? And according to the explanation, he will begin to talk about four cups, actually not glasses, four cups of wine that will be presented throughout this meal. Stay with me. These four cups, again, aren't just so they can have a good old time to turn the party up. <laughs> right? These four cups represented four promises that God had given the children of Israel. In Exodus chapter 6, verses 6 through 7, I won't read it, but I do want you to know that these promises represented four things. One, rescue from Egypt. Two, freedom from slavery. Three, redemption by, the God, by God's divine power. And four, a renewed relationship with God. These four cups, again, for the whole 1,500 year span were, were celebrated, were partaken of, and were explained during this feast. So part of the preparation that Peter and John had just now been assigned to do was getting ready for this. Not only that, they had to prepare the lamb. They had to find the lamb, kill the lamb. During the Passover season, the lamb couldn't be killed in somebody's backyard. The lamb could only be, take, only be killed in one place, the temple grounds the temple grounds, because this wasn't any old lamb. This was a lamb that had to be consecrated as a substitute, consecrated as a substitute. So what they would do is they would, they would find the lamb, slay the lamb, and then they would drain the animal's blood into a basin in the days of old that were held by the priest who then splashed it against the base of the altar. This represented forgiveness of sin, atonement of sin. See, this had great meaning over the years for them. Not only that, the fat from the lamb and the kidneys were burnt on the altar as a part of a peace offering, right? This spoke to relationship restored between God and the worshiper's family. We did that. All right, 
our year is going to be blessed. Everything is now good. And after the sacrifice, each of the household then took what was remaining home before sunset, and they cooked it. They roasted the meat, and keeping with God's instructions to Moses, they ate. And I can imagine it was amazing. This, this was all part of the necessary preparations for Passover. Now, what's interesting about this time, this first century example, is that, again, Jerusalem is crowded. It is likely, as I've read in many commentaries, that supplies were short and time is running out. People are crowding into the city, right? Not only that, whatever room you had, you had to make sure that it was cleared of leaven before you could ever partake of this consecrated lamb. And that took sometimes a couple days, right? So Jesus, again, he knew what they did not know. He knew that it was critical for them to celebrate this Passover meal that night, that night. Because this would be the final meal. This wasn't just a Passover meal. This was the Last Supper. And what he's doing for them and for us as we look back and see this, he's transforming the Passover celebration into the Lord's Supper, which would be commemorated by Jesus on the cross in about 24 hours. He's up to something. He has a, a prearranged plan that they don't know and that they don't understand. Is this not like us today when things occur in our lives that we don't understand and we got questions for God. When the things that we're experiencing, whether it is minor things, major things, things that look like crises, God, what is happening? God, where are you? There are things that he knows that we don't know. Can we trust him? Can we trust that he's in control when what is happening in my life don't look like nobody's in control? This is easy to preach. Not easy to live. I have to take this moment to say something to you, and this goes for any, any of you who feel called to, to preach and communicate God's word. God, God's word in a setting like this before a group of people, or if it's even privately, maybe it's one-on-one. -on -one. Like we, you, God may grant you a special anointing to say it, to communicate it, right? But we have no different anointing than anybody else to live it out. This has to be lived out. Too many times I feel like God is saying something, and I'm, I'm like, okay, keep talking. <laughs> Let me know what happens next. <laughs> Let me know what happens down the street, around the corner. And cr you know, God is like, no, no, go to the city. <laughs> You're going to find a man. <laughs> oh, man, <laughs> all right. So I got to go do that. And then when that happens, he begins to shed more light. But I have to learn to trust him in the first step. I got to learn what it means to, to have an ear that is attentive to his voice before I know the whole plan. What is it about us that want to know the whole plan? Uh, that right there will preach by itself. See, what helps us understand all of that or relate to all of that is, is knowing one thing that, that God ultimately has one objective. One. Please hear this. He only ultimately has one objective, his divine purpose. His divine plan, his divine purpose, which he will receive full glory for. So unless we can see him as God, we may question his motives. Unless we can see him as good, we will question his motives. So this is a part of what it means for us as we partake of the bread and the wine. God, we're saying we trust you. We trust you. We know that you are good. You are providential. And you will not leave us hanging. Family, this, this is everything to us as we begin 
to learn what it means to mature in the faith and to discern his will. We're going to be talking about that in a few more weeks. I wish I had more time tonight, to even today to even unpack. How do we determine, how do we discern the will of God? This is probably the most, this is the biggest request that I have from God's people. How do I know what God is saying, when he's saying it? How do I know if I should take this job or take that job? Move to this city or that city? And sometimes we get real, real silly with it. I don't know if I should go to this restaurant today or that restaurant. Like, okay, we're doing too much right now. We're doing too much. But, 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 it, but. I will say that as we grow immature, nothing in our lives is done without having a sense of peace and understanding that God is in the midst of it and he is fulfilling his divine purposes. Now, what's crazy, y'all, in this moment here, like God, God is, wants us to know something that I think is significant when we think about communion and celebrating Passover that may not be uh, on the forefront of our minds. I'm going to go to my next point here in, in a Passover persecution. Passover persecution. Jesus knows that one of his own is about to betray him. However, that's just one. The other 11 are about to abandon him. And he still calls them in. He still calls them in. Let's look at verse 17. This is God at work. It says, and when it was evening, he came with the 12. He came with the 12. So they have arrived to Jerusalem and they've come to the upper room and Peter and John have already prepared the room for Passover. John 13 tells us something that continues to stick with me and reverberate in my heart and mind. And it says Jesus loved them to the end. He loved them to the end. Wait, did you hear what I just said? He knew one was about to betray him and the rest were about to abandon him. These were not Jesus' associates. These were his closest friends. This was his reconstructed family. Remember a few earlier in the, in the book of Mark when his actual family came looking for him? And, 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 and some of his people said, hey, your family's looking for you. Jesus was like, who's my family? He redefines family for us. My family are those that do the will of my father. That's who's in the room. His closest friends. The Passover meal was a meal that was not eaten among strangers. It was a meal that was celebrated among family members. Even those who had traveled from all over the world to Jerusalem, they had to prepare a space for them. This was a family celebration. And this is Jesus' reconfigured family. And verse 18 says, and as they were reclining at table and eating, Jesus says, truly I say to you, one of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. This is shocking. Like this is, like for them to hear that, now let me just back up a little bit. Mark doesn't give us this detail, but John does. What happens after Jesus, is say, Jesus says, uh, Mark says he loved them to the end. They started arguing over who was the greatest. Again, we've heard this argument before. And what does Jesus do? What does Jesus do? He bends down, grabs a basin of water, and starts to wash their feet. Like he displays an act of, of humility and service to, to, to them that is shocking. This is not something that someone of Jesus' stature would do, let alone during Passover. In their mind, he's breaking all the rules, but he's also convicting them as they are full of ego and pride, talking about who's the greatest. And one of them, Satan, has entered into their heart. Can you imagine what Judas felt like as Jesus was washing his feet with Satan right there on the inside of him? Jesus didn't rebuke him. Jesus, Jesus didn't say, get behind me, Satan. Jesus didn't say, loose here, come on out of him. He knelt down and he washed his feet, his nasty, dusty, stinking, hard-heeled feet. 
is shocking. But he's displaying something that I think that we have to keep in mind. That persecution comes in all shapes and sizes. And it comes in many forms. And some, sometimes it may come in the shape of a betrayal by someone you expected something different from. Other times it can come in the form of an abandonment. Right? It brings to mind the words of David in Psalm 41, he's, 41, 9. He says, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted his heel against me. Now, even while they're all about to fail him, I don't want to get into, I don't want to steal next week's thunder. But verse 27 lets us know this in case you're wondering where I got this from. Verse 27 says, Judas left a little earlier, but in verse 27, all of them left him. They all left him. Yet this is something that has to happen. This word that betray, it means to, to give over. It means to hand over or to give over. Now, what I want us to do in my time is, is running out here. It's so easy for us, y'all, to look at Judas and like, mm, 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 ain't, ain't that a mess. <laughs> mm, mm, mm. Jesus sure was a nice guy. It couldn't be me, but amen. <laughs> <laughs> Verse 19, it says, they begin to be sorrowful and say to one, and say to him one after another, after he had just said what was about to happen. Is it I? Is it I? Now, I want you to see something here. I believe that in placing the betrayal in between the last supper preparation and the last supper participation, Mark is helping us understand something, right? That in the midst of knowing who Jesus is and, and our focus being on him, our worship being in him and, and on him, there is, we are also very, very close to tremendous pain and hurt in our lives. Tremendous. Lindsay said it better than I could right now earlier, Right? Because we're walking with Jesus doesn't mean the absence of hardship. It doesn't mean the absence of suffering. It's that while we're in it, we're not in it alone. Listen, every time we partake of this meal, like we have to understand something. There's evil, the essentiality or the universality of evil is always present. That's what we learn from this betrayal story right in the midst of this Mark and Sandwich, as we've been talking about, right, Mark? Also often presents us these stories in a sandwich form, right? Two narratives sandwiched by one narrative in the middle. The narrative in the middle here is the betrayal with, in the midst of our celebration of Passover, we can't look at Judas as down there. No, it's in here. It's right here. Again, this is called the, the doctrine of universality of sin. I heard her once said that the line dividing good from evil goes down the center of every human heart. Not, the, not city to city, not nation to nation, not gender to gender, no. Every human heart. That means it's not enough to say, like the disciples, is it me? It's not enough to say, what have I done? We have to ask, what am I capable of doing? What? That's a tough question, y'all. <laughs> that doesn't jive well for our religious, spiritual sensibilities, right? It may not, it may not want to make you lift up holy hands and shout makes us want to fall on our faces. In other words, if placed under similar conditions like Judas, how different would I be? Would I, would I be susceptible to the temptation of the wicked one? Would, if I was placed in similar conditions and opportunities and temptations, would I also give in? Could I produce great evil? Oh, God. I don't want to answer that question. Like, why didn't Ju Jesus just call out Judas? You ever think about that? Like, he, he knew it. He could have just called him out. Judas ended up leaving anyway. Just call him out, Jesus, like the white witch of Narnia. Remember when she says, you have a traitor in your midst, and there he is. <laughs> Jesus doesn't do that. No. 
He says, one of you will betray me. He doesn't say who. He just says, and what happened? Why is this? I think that he wants, he wants each of us as disciples to examine our own hearts. Paul tells us when we partake of the, the Lord's table, we must do that exactly, examine our own hearts. The sin of betrayal has taken on, a, a, I would say, a, a different or evolved meaning over time. But get this, on the surface, it, it simply means one who will serve someone as long as it benefits them. But the moment you sell me out, or the moment it costs me, I sell you out. I'll say that again. I'm going to serve you as long as it benefits me. But as long as it costs me something that I am not willing to pay, I'm out. I'll sell you out. I'll give you over. That's what the word means, literally. To give over, to hand over, to sell. I mean, it, it means we have, we have two kinds of disciples, right? Like both disciples are doing what Jesus says to do. Judas has heard so many messages, sermons. Jesus, Judas has not only seen Jesus heal people, Judas healed people. Judas cast out devils. Judas was respectable, good with money. Can you imagine the fact that, first of all, Jesus had a treasurer. The disciples had a treasurer. You don't have, you have a treasurer unless you got a treasure, right? <laughs> he was stealing money and nobody knew. I, I said, that tell us how, how hard it is to spot superficial Christianity? Superficial followers of Jesus? Like, we can't be impressed with people, y'all. Never be impressed with somebody's gift. Listen, oh gosh, the body of Christ right now is being ransacked over those who have been propelled to some high status because they're gifted. And I'm not just talking about natural gifts, spiritual gifts. They'll prophesy in a minute, lay hands on someone in a minute, and they may get healed. That ain't nothing to be impressed by a person about. I don't want, uh, I, don't, I wish I had more time. I don't have time to dig into that. But this is. This is something that each of us have to examine our own hearts. Jesus says, one of you have betrayed me. And look at what they do. They don't deny it, right? They don't confess it. They each say, could it me? <laughs> no. Could it, Jesus, could it be me? No. Is it me? The commentators say that this is a remarkably ambivalent response, both emotionally and linguistically. Me? What? <laughs> yes. That's what Jesus wants us to see, right? <laughs> he wants them to see, and he wants us to see that we may not be a Judas through and through, but we've each got a Judas in us. <sighs> see, there's a part of our hearts that can question, what good is this Christianity thing? I mean, I'm doing all the stuff, God, that you have asked me to do. The Judas part's part of us. Like, we operate, we, we cling towards religion. And religion says, the paradigm is, I obey, therefore I am. I obey, therefore I am accepted, and therefore God owes me something. That's religion. That's Judas. The gospel operates on a different principle. The gospel says, I am accepted in the beloved. I am already accepted in the infinite grace and the love of God. Therefore, I obey and owe him everything. That's the gospel. This Judas spirit is always, always lurking. Now, just as I, I know that's maybe strong to hear. You have a, I have a Judas in me? What? The devil is a lie. I want you to know you also have a Mary in you. We heard about her last week. Who offered her costly perfume for Jesus by washing his feet. Judas had a problem with it. 
Now, we see here the ulterior motives of Judas are revealed. Judas found Jesus useful. Mary found Jesus beautiful. Judas used Jesus to get things. Mary loved Jesus to get more of Jesus. Like this, is, this is the difference for us, y'all. This, this is where the rubber meets the road. More of him. John the Baptist said, I need more of you and less of me. Like in the midst of persecution from the world, in the midst of persecution from within our ranks, like this has to be the, the desire of our hearts. I got to move on. I got to move on. I want to encourage you to watch how you respond to him. Watch your prayers. Watch the longings and the desires of your hearts when you think about the goodness of God. And look for, ask Holy Spirit to show you, where am I being transactional? Where am I treating you like a genie in a bottle? Where, am I, where is my worship towards you because you're useful to me? Back in undergrad, I had to, um, I had to listen to uh, some classical music for this enjoyment of music class, right? And uh, this, this enjoyment of music class uh, turned out to be nothing like I expected. All right, as a music guy, I'm kind of excited about this class. It was extremely boring and long, but there was this required assignment, and I had to listen to 100 hours of classical music and make a, a journal entry for each composer. Now, I had a whole, a whole semester to do it, right? However, <laughs> you know, the kind of planner that I am, uh, I waited till there was barely 100 hours left in the semester. <laughs> it was torture. Uh, Mozart, Beethoven, uh, Tchaikovsky, Tavinsky, uh, Bach, all those great guys. Findelson. And uh, I worked around the clock to get it done because I had to get it done. I had to do it. It served my purpose of getting my degree, right? right? It served the purpose of passing the class. It served a purpose, so I didn't waste my money. It was useful to me, but I didn't enjoy it. I didn't do it because it was beautiful to me. I do it, did it because it was assigned to me. And I will say, something happened during that time. At first, I had to do it because it was assigned to me. I got it done. It wasn't until years later that I started to notice a craving. <laughs> I started to develop an appetite for the sonatas, the oboes and the bassoons, the cellos. I know I'm losing some of y'all, right? But, but listen, I, I can't explain it. Like even now, I'll throw, go on YouTube and throw on the orchestra. Like if there's a beauty in it that I had to learn over time. What Jesus does to Judas, he gives him an opportunity, I believe, to change his mind. He offers him a morsel of bread. Like to, off, to offer someone at the table a morsel of bread was a, a distinction of high honor. He wasn't doing this just to be more cryptic. I believe he was giving him a chance to change his mind. Verse 21 says, for the son of man goes as it is written of him. But woe to that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. So it's strong language. See, some argue here that, that Judas actually didn't portray Jesus. He actually just cooperated with Jesus because this was God's purpose all along. But that's not what this verse tells us here. What this verse tells us, this verse combines divine sovereignty and human responsibility. Judas chose to betray Jesus. He chose it. His actions were foreknown by God. And God in his infinite wisdom worked them into his overall large plan. There's both sovereignty and responsibility at work here in this Passover story. This is something that we also must keep in mind. 
Again, that's a whole message of itself. But Jesus says something. He says, it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. It's an emphasis here on the punishment that is coming here. Matthew tells us that he was very sorrowful. Um, but this idea of sorrowful is not repentance. It's regret. It's not repentance. It's remorse. They aren't necessarily the same thing. See, repentance speaks to a change of heart and a change of mind, right? Remorse is expressing regret. I wish that didn't happen. The two terms can overlap, as Scripture even tells us, right? But they're not the same. Paul tells us in Corinthians that godly sorrow produces repentance. Mm. All right, I got to move on. There's more here, but I got to move on. My last point here is just this Passover partnership, fellowship. God is in our midst. And this is what we experience in the table, verse 22. And as they were eating, he took the bread. And after blessing it, he broke it and he gave it to them. And he said, take, this is my body. In Aramaic, it would, the, 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 the verb is is not even there in Aramaic as Jesus, Jesus spoke Arabic, right? It would have sounded like, not phonetically, but just the transliteration, this, my body. This, my body, indicating that he himself, his person, his identity is what this represents. Their eating the meal with him signifies their participation in him and with him in receiving a new identity. What is this new identity represented by? Death. Verse 23 says, and he took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. This would have been, remember I mentioned earlier there were four cups normally during the Passover meal. This here would have been the third cup of the Passover meal that followed the blood, I'm sorry, that followed the main course. This is the third cup that followed the main course. Now Jesus here, he stands up and he blesses the food. He invites them to partake, but there's something drastically different about this celebration, this feast. All the Passover meals, as I mentioned before, had bread, had wine, and had a meal. They had a full course meal, right? None of the Gospels mention anything other than bread and wine and some bitter herbs, right? But no full course meal. There's no mention of a lamb here. And we know that Passover is not a vegetarian meal, right? No, there was lamb. How would Passover be Passover without a lamb? <laughs> like, it'll preach itself. Please hear this. There's lamb. <laughs> There's no lamb on the table because the lamb is the table. He's at the table. He, he, he now is the table once and for all. There will never, ever have to be another lamb sacrificed for this purpose because it had been done once for all for good. Jesus, the worthy lamb that was slain. And then he says, truly, I tell you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. This fruit of the vine was a Jewish colloquialism. It's almost like when someone says, I'm not going to eat or drink until I do fill in the blank. They're, they're, they're giving an oath, right? It's a, it's a consummation of sorts. We can think of it in the terms of a marriage, right? When you go on the honeymoon, I'm not, this may sound old school to some, <laughs> but you consummate your marriage through the sex act on the honeymoon. When it's consummated, it's finalized. This is the idea here that Jesus is saying, I will not drink again until that day when I drink it in the kingdom of God. What is that day? He's speaking of the marriage feast of the Lamb spoken of in Revelation chapter 13. What I'm saying is this meal that we're about to partake of now, bread and wine, is a look forward to a meal that will last seven years. That won't, won't just have bread, wine, 
I'm not sure if it's going to have lamb. Obadiah tells us that Jesus is going to be on the mic. It's gonna, it says it's going to be endless delicatessens, endless desserts. Like, I, can't, I can only imagine this. <laughs> Jesus says, I'm not drinking again until I drink of that cup, the fourth and the last cup. And what he does, he gives them himself. He gives them himself, y'all. Like, listen, we can never be who God has called us to be as Christians, as a church, Detroit church. Maybe you're here visiting another part of a, a local church. Like, we're, like, part of what it means to be the church means to know him, not know about him. This know him is to express a, a, like an intimacy it is, it is fellowship. It is knowing that he is in our midst. He's given himself for us. Like this is major to us. Like scripture calls it the fear of the Lord. I think this, this, is, this is like a sense of all that God is here. Like do we have this anymore? Have you ever had that sense of awe? See, when we go back and understand what this time of year represented for them, the aroma in the air, the lambs being slain, the preparation, the hustle and the bustle, the crowded streets, all of it invoked a sense of fear. God said, do this because we know that this last plague was, was first, was, was, was uh, before nine plagues right, that invoked the fear of the Lord. God should not be played with. He's not like men that he will lie. He's in control. Like, I pray that as we partake of him, not just bread and wine, that there's a deep growing sense of fellowship with him. And that I'm not just doing this because this is like what the church says I should do, but because I've been made one with you. Like Detroit Church, I'm going to talk to you specifically right now. Like this idea of hosting him, his presence, is our main responsibility. And I'll put it that way. I'm not saying our only one. We will learn what it means to walk in love. We'll learn what it means to serve others because of our time with him. Because of seeing how he loved us to the end. How he loved Judas and Peter and John and all of them dudes to the very end. But how are we hosting his presence? How are we responding with, with reverence and awe to the fact that he is holy? Or when we get to talking about these things, does it, become, does it become weird for us? Do we feel like, oh, that's just for the spiritual Christians? I'm not there yet. Listen, this isn't about, like, performance. This isn't, like, spiritual calisthenics. This isn't emotionalism. I believe that God is trying to help us reverence him, see him, and his holiness high and lifted up and knowing that we couldn't pay our own price for sin. We deserve judgment. We deserve punishment, eternal punishment. But God, in his infinite mercy, has sent Jesus in our place. What a God. What a God. What if God said to us, Detroit Church, I'm not going to give you a building to allow you to host a neighborhood until you can first learn how to host my presence? What if? April 10th, it'll be eight years. Eight years. Eight years ago, Jesus planted this church. He wasn't planning a pulpit. He was planning a church. He wasn't planting a, a people. I'm sorry, a, a pulpit. He was planting a people of his own possession. He wasn't planting just an experience. He was planting the ecclesia, an, ex an expression of the ecclesia. Like, I, like he has to be our first love and not just a few of the leaders no, all of us, this is what the table represents. We all sit before him 
deserving punishment. The table is for the betrayers, the abandoners. It's for all of us, the outcast, those of part, who are part of his reconfigured family, but now learning what it means to do his will and to discern his presence. He is in our midst. This won't happen because you've been coerced into lifting your hands, singing loud, or the band is sounding real, real good. They're playing your jam. This ain't about that at all. But this is about our longing for him, not just when we're here, but when we leave, when we lay down at night, when we wake up in the morning in the midst of our, our biggest temptation and struggle. Do we want him then? Or are we quick to sell him out when it's convenient? Or when something else becomes more useful to us? Jesus knows what's about to happen. He's helped his friends prepare to demonstrate how in control he is. He lets them know, I'm about to be persecuted. This betrayal is just one part of it. Persecution more than they can ever imagine. He prepares the table. He presents himself at the table. They eat. Do you know what else happens? Verse 26 tells us, and when they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. Did you catch that? Jesus on the mic. They're singing. Judas is left at the, by this point. And they sing. This was a part of their tradition. The Passover meal would be culminated with this, this song, right? And what they would sing was Psalm 118. Psalm 118. Now, I, I, we're not going to read all of this, but I want you to, I want you to just kind of see some of what Psalm 8, 118 says. Because some of it, I believe, is going to be very familiar to some of us. This is what it says. These are some of the verses. Verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good, for his steadfast love endures forever. This is a man that's about to be murdered. That's about to give his life to be murdered in less than 24 hours. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His steadfast love endures for a moment. Forever. Out of distress, verse 5 says, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. Okay, Jesus, the Lord is on my side. I will not fear. What can man do to me? This is Jesus and the disciples worshiping. They're worshiping. Verse 7, he says, the Lord is on my side as my helper. I shall look in triumph on those who hate me. <laughs> the Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Woo, Jesus. Verse 17. I shall not die, but I shall live and recount the deeds of the Lord. Verse 22. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Do you think he knows when David first wrote, wrote that? You think Jesus knows he was talking about him? Please believe it. His worship is, is bringing a fulfillment to the songs and the desires and the worship of the children of Israel for over 1,500 years. Verse 23, you've heard this one. This is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Do you see, can you imagine how Jesus is preparing his own heart for what's about to happen? As we keep on reading, we know that there was a struggle in his flesh. He asked God, is there any other way for this cup to be passed? Maybe the reason why he was able to get over that was because of this worship moment where he says, this is the Lord's doing, and it's marvelous in our eyes. Surely you've heard of this one. This is what Jesus says, what he sings. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Come on, repeat after me. This is the day the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. I don't care what tomorrow brings you. I don't care what kind of betrayal or abandonment you can dream up. You can say boldly with Jesus and the disciples as they worship, this is the day.
that the Lord has made and I will rejoice. See, sometimes you got to tell yourself what you would do. Like take authority over your own flesh. No, you will not trip flesh. You will not complain. You will not stay in worry, in doubt, and having a pity party. I will rejoice. We can see now the victory that, that I, I can just imagine the disciples looking at Jesus and what he had just said. <laughs> what he had just said and hearing his worship. Oh, give thanks to the Lord for he is good and his steadfast love endures forever. Glory to God. Stand to your feet.